Hi and welcome to the Windows Kernel Programming Fundamentals course here on Pentester Academy. My name is Pavel and I'll be your guide throughout this course. So what about strings? Many kernel APIs require us to pass around strings. And so the kernel APIs mostly accept this particular structure called a Unicode string. And that structure represents a UTF-16 string. And the way it works, you can see the definition right here in the slide, it has a length and maximum length and a buffer. So the buffer points to the actual uh, string of characters. So this is the pointer to the actual characters, but the string doesn't have to be null terminated and should never assume that this string is null terminated. Instead, the length of the string, and by the way, the length is in bytes, is stored within that Unicode string. And the maximum length uh, value indicates how much more space is available or how much space is available for incrementing the size of the string without needing to perform uh, some reallocation. And so in simple cases, length and maximum length will have the same value, but maximum length can be greater depending on how you create that string and manipulate that. And so many APIs use this particular structure. So you need to know how to work with that. So here are a few common functions to work with Unicode string. And so the first one is called RTL init Unicode string. And this is kind of the, the simplest one that initializes a Unicode string based on a C style string. So if I have a C style string already allocated and it's null terminated, it must be null terminated in this case, then RTL int Unicode string will just go ahead and calculate the length of that string and we'll set the length and maximum length to the length of the string and point the buffer member to the uh, C style string. And so it's only initializing that data structure based on an existing C style string. And so there's no opposite function for that uh, because there's nothing to free here. It's just initializing a data structure based on an existing string. And there are many other functions you can find uh, in the documentation. Most of them start with the RTL prefix, which means generic runtime library functions, sort of a runtime library within the kernel. So you can compare strings, you can copy strings, and there's another way to initialize a string, a Unicode string using the RTL constant string a macro, which I'll demonstrate uh, later on. And so we'll look at many examples of using strings uh, throughout the course. Another thing which is fairly common in user mode and should be common in kernel mode as well is asserts and doing some traces. And so the purpose of asserts is generally to, to ascertain whether a specific uh, condition is true. If it's true, then we can continue execution. Otherwise, we want to break indicating an assertion failure. And so if an assertion fails, it means that something that I was sure is true apparently is false. And so in kernel mode, we can use the anti-assert macro. And that macro is only compiled in check builds, that is debug builds, which means that in a release build, that's just going to go away. And so it's very cheap to use because I know that in the final result, in the final binary, when I deploy that in release mode, then that macro will not have any adverse effect on the performance of my driver. We need to be careful, however, to make sure that everything we put inside anti-assert doesn't have any side effects because the entire anti-assert goes away and not just the, um, including the whatever expression I, I put inside. And so I need to make sure there are no side effects in that expression. So what happens when an assertion fails in, in case of a kernel assertion? So if a kernel debugger is connected uh, to that target, then the debugger will break indicating the assertion failed. It's going to show us the line number where that happens and we can look at that uh, data. And then we can decide whether we want to continue or to ignore the, the assertion, continue running or not. However, if there is no kernel debugger attached, then we get uh, a bug check that is a blue screen and the blue screen will point, the dump file that is hopefully going to be created will point to the correct instruction that caused the session failure. Another thing that is fairly common is the ability or the idea to have some output that we can look at 
without the need, for example, to set up breakpoints to see values of variables or get some text information that we have uh, executed some function and so on. And so for this purpose, we have these functions dbgprint and dbgprintex. So dbgprintex is the more modern function and dbgprint is actually implemented in terms of dbgprintex. And the purpose of this output is to provide some form of text, textual string. And it also supports all the, the various uh, uh, things you can use in a printf style string. So you can use percent %d, percent %u, or percent %whatever uh, to output some uh, information. And so these particular functions always output the information. However, they do have some overhead and so it's typical to only use them in, in debug builds. And so for that purpose, we have the kdprint, a kdprintex macros that just wrap these functions that uh, produce their output in debug builds, but don't do that in release builds. And so to watch this output, you can do that using a kernel debugger. In fact, that requires some more configuration, which I'll describe uh, later on. Or you can use the debug view uh, tool from sysinternals that can always be used to uh, capture this output. In fact, this is a very useful tool uh, to use for this purpose. And I'm going to demonstrate that uh, later on uh, as well. The last thing I want to describe here in terms of kind of general things we need to know when working with kernel APIs is a data structure called object attributes. And so object attributes is a data structure that is used with many uh, kernel APIs. And we need to know how to work without, with that data structure. And see, the structure is actually documented, so you can just go ahead and initialize its fields properly. However, there's a macro called initialize object attributes, which we typically use. And then we can provide the various parameters which are stored within this data structure. So one of them is the name that is applicable to a particular function that we're using. So for instance, if I go ahead and go back to the documentation for ZW create file, one of the things I expect for this function to have is a file name, which kind of makes sense. I need to provide the file that I want to actually open or create. And so if you look at these parameters, nothing here looks like a string. Nothing here looks like a file name. In fact, that is actually hidden within this object attribute structure that I'm just describing. And so the actual file name is actually here. And so before calling the w create file, I have to initialize an object attribute structure with the appropriate file name that I want to pass along to function such as zw create file. And so the first parameter is an object name, which is again a Unicode string structure. I need to provide that. And then there's a set of attributes that you can specify as part of this structure. And there are several ones here. I want to uh, describe two of them at this uh, point. One of them is called case insensitive, which instructs the, uh, the call that is going to follow that initialization to do a case insensitive search. So for example, if I'm opening a file or trying to open a named uh, kernel object, such as a mutex or a semaphore, then it instructs the, uh, the API to do a case insensitive search. Another common flag to use is kernel handle. This means that if I'm going to use that function, uh, that object attribute structure with a function that returns a handle, such as the w create file, I can specify this uh, flag to indicate that I want to get back a kernel handle rather than a user mode handle. And the difference is that the user mode handle is only valid in the context of the process where that handle was created. However, a kernel handle, which is of course can only be obtained uh, in kernel mode, is valid in any process context. And so I can get such a handle and then use that handle with whatever the current process is. Don't have to actually worry about having a handle in the appropriate uh, process context. And so many kernel APIs actually use uh, this flag. And perhaps we'll meet other flags in, in a future course. Another thing we can specify is the root directory in the object manager's namespace. So that's the namespace we see with a tool such as WinOBJ, which we will uh, examine uh, later on once we uh, look at a specific uh, driver example. And we've seen that already uh, a little bit. 
And so if we are not providing a fully qualified name for the particular object, then we can have a root directory, which is going to be the basis. And from that, from that location, the name that we provide is going to be sort of the, the continuation of that name. And there's an optional security descriptor we can provide uh, to this function. And again, I'll demonstrate how to use this function uh, later on. Mm -hmm.